While we're struggling with this, it is really interesting hearing us talk once again with this same cycle that I've heard so many times now. I guess the longer you're in the field, the longer, the, the more technologies you've seen come and go, the more often you hear very new technologies being used for very old goals. Bit today. Um, and it seems to me that we are, as usual, making our way through Ascilla and Charybdis. And this is, so Odysseus, when he went on his grand quest, um, was called to by two monsters, sirens, one on the left of him and one on the right of him. And each said, come here, come here, it's good here. And this is Scylla uh, for television, that television can benefit your children, uh, improve their marks at school, and make their lives better in every single way. And I didn't blow this up because we don't have time, but if you'd like to see this, it's truly extraordinary. It's really television as bait. If you want your child to do something, just say you'll take away television if your child doesn't do it. And the Charybdis in this case, and I am gonna try and show this to you because it's so wonderful. Um, this is a spot, a public service announcement. So run for free. Anything to protect it. Build fences, so install security tech. Wait, wait, you have to hear it from the beginning. We would do anything to protect our children. Anything to protect them. Build fences, install security systems, even move to a safer neighborhood. When your children are at home, you think they're safe, but are they? What about the internet? Have you taught them to protect themselves online? Make internet safety a family concern. Visit www.netsmarts.org. Did you see the bad guy? I love the bad guy. So this is a, a PSA that ran um, around eight years ago, I think. And um, let's get this back. Uh, and I think it represents well the. Yep. Okay. Represents well those um, those eddies that we've been running between today. Is this all good or is it all bad? And in my own work, I've experienced the same thing. I work in what you might call mixed reality. I build um, systems that are not immersive in what I would call it immersive. They're virtual children, virtual adults on a screen. Children aren't asked to imagine that they are on the screen or that the children are in reality. But we found ways for them to exchange toys back and forth between the real and the virtual world. And we've done this work with children with high-functioning autism and children in under-resourced schools and so forth. And at various times, this has been touted, this was the World Economic Forum last year, where our work was touted as one of the bright spots, I think actually the phrase was, one of the only bright spots <laughs> in AI's future. And uh, it's also been touted as the end of make-believe. So I've uh, witnessed firsthand the Scylla and Charybdis that we go through. But what I come to think is that we're not thinking enough about what it is we want to do. So this is a system, whoops, well, I'll tell you what happened, well, shoot. <laughs> okay, this is a system that we built for children in um, schools where the children speak a dialect different than the dialect that the teacher, than the teacher speaks. And this is the case for probably 75% of the children in the US, increasing numbers of children, in fact. These particular children uh, speak African-American vernacular English, and their teacher tells them routinely several times a day to stop speaking bad English. But they don't speak bad English. They, good, they speak good African-American vernacular. I don't have time to go into the arguments for that. If you don't believe me, happy to talk about it at length and bore you to tears with over it. Drinks. Yeah, over drinks, probably. You'll, you'll receive it better. Um, and we tried out two hypotheses uh, that are common hypotheses. The first is that children shouldn't have to bear the cognitive load of learning both a new topic and a new dialect at the same time. And so if the teacher or if someone else spoke in their dialect for half of their work for the brainstorming and then said, okay, we have to speak our school English when we present, that's one hypothesis. And the other is no dialect should ever be allowed in the school whatsoever under no circumstances should we allow children to talk that way because they'll think it's okay. 
And that second one is the dominant one today. So we had one virtual child who um, did one and one virtual child who did the other. And unfortunately, I can't show you this, and I really wanted to because I think it's really, um, earlier today we heard someone say, you can see how excited and immersed this child is. Um, but this child is really excited and immersed, but not immersed. So the, the virtual child says, what do you think we need to do? How high do we need to make the bridge? The kid answers. Virtual child responds. The kid says, you took my idea. And the virtual child says, nah-uh. And the real child says, uh-huh. And it's just a very childlike endeavor. And lo and behold, it turned out that the virtual child, who, I mean the real child who worked with the virtual child speaking dialect, acquired more science discourse, made greater gains in science discourse, but really the true result was that that result was mediated by rapport, that the children felt higher rapport with the agent who spoke like they did, and when they felt higher rapport, they made greater gains in science discourse. Teachers can't speak that dialect, they don't feel it's right, they don't feel that um, they're in a position to do it without it feeling like it makes fun, and so this is something that a virtual child can do that a real child can't do. And that's really my point. Um, I'd really like to see us move past optimism and pessimism and start thinking about what we do and why we do it. If we have a new technology, it's not a hammer looking for a nail. It's a set of opportunities and challenges, and I think that's really what we've been told all day today. It's a, a, an opportunity to think in a new way about the tasks that we want children to be able to do in the real world, about the populations that we want to work with, a broader, hopefully, range of populations, about what it means to be a computer. It can be a piece of fabric, or it can be a room, any one of a number of things. Um, do we think of one child as the unit of analysis? I no longer do, I think of dyads. I always work with the dyad. What would it mean to have sociality be a basic unit of analysis in our work? And I think about abilities different. Um, children are multi-abilitied, and they also have different abilities from one another. So really what I'm asking you to do is to parameterize your design goals and to think first about what you want to do, what do we want to do today and in our future, and then look past a perfect technology and a terrible technology to whichever technology happens to be best for those developmental imperatives and design goals that help children meet those imperatives. So um, designing for sociality, I agree with Michael 100% that we really need to have children face to face with other children. Also with their parents, I care less about that <laughs> personally. Uh, but they certainly need sociality in their lives. Um, design for them to be able to construct selves, multiple selves, and play with them, perhaps in a safer way than I did, for example for a multiplicity of uses. And for me, this is extremely important. And like Susanna said, I have been shocked at how little I've heard this today. Children should be producers and not just consumers. How often have we said this? How many times are we going to need to say this with each new technology? So I often get asked to talk about Alexa and Siri, and so I went online and I found these great videos usually by eight and nine-year-olds, that seems to be the key age, of children hacking Alexa. Now that is good technology. Yeah. A technology that can be hacked by children and made to do things so that children are engaging with their bodies and their minds and making something their own. And that, to me, is really the definition of a good technology, is something that can be appropriated, that allows children to produce in order to fulfill these goals. Um, I'm sure you all, because we all work on these kinds of things, get asked to predict the future. And I, I always refuse now, because we can't predict the future. I can't. I'll speak for myself. Perhaps you can. But we can make it happen, and perhaps that's what we should be thinking about. Thanks. <laughs>